journey, you are welcome here at David's United Church of Christ. I'm the Reverend James Simmelroth Darnell, the senior pastor here at David's, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the worship of God this morning. Today is the third Sunday after Epiphany, and today we hear the familiar story of the prophet Jonah. This morning we have a few announcements. Throughout January, our special offering will be toward the organization Bread which stands for Building Responsibility, Equality, and Dignity, as an organization throughout the Columbus region that brings together uh, congregations and a diverse group of people from the Columbus area to solve various social justice issues. So we invite you this month to give generously to Brad. There are a variety of opportunities for Uh, children's ministry and youth ministry for Holy Moly classes, which will happen every other week for uh, your children and youth. invite you to uh, see the schedule, and if you have questions, to contact Brenda Francis, our minister for children and youth. There are many ways to give here at David's. You can give on our website through Tithely, or you can give directly Uh, through your financial institution to the church, or simply mail your gift to the church office. Any way that you give to David's United Church of Christ, we greatly appreciate your generosity and your faithful stewardship. We continue to need your generosity as we minister in this time. Even as we are socially distanced, we continue to share God's love and light with our community and with the world. Our annual meeting will take place next Sunday, January 31st at 11 a.m. Following our worship service, it will take place via Zoom. We will hear uh, the reports of our committees from the following year, and we will elect new officers for the church consistory and to our committees. So I hope that you all will join us next Sunday as we gather uh, to hear the business of the church and look forward to faithful ministry this coming year. So let us continue in worship and pray with one another. Holy One, you have called us by name. You will not let us lounge in bed. You wake us up in the middle of the night to remember. You will not let us hide under the tree. You summon us from the shade to be changed. You will not let us bury our secrets within the earth. You unearth our fears and speak them aloud. Forgive us, O God, when we cannot speak and reveal the words we need the most. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
not to follow directions from your teachers or parents. I know I have. And when I didn't, it was because I maybe didn't want to. I didn't want to be told what to do. Sometimes we might not want to follow directions because we don't understand why we have to do something. Or we disagree about it, or we might even be afraid. In the book of Jonah, we learn about a man named Jonah who didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. So he chose to disobey, and he had some consequences. God wanted Jonah to go to a place called Nineveh, but Jonah didn't want to go. God really needed Jonah's help because God wanted to help the people of Nineveh. They were making bad choices and God wanted Jonah to go warn them and help them turn around their lives and worship God. But Jonah didn't want to go because he didn't want to help the people that lived in Nineveh. He didn't want to love them. God helped Jonah learn a very important lesson about listening and following God's plans. So God had an even bigger way to get Jonah's attention. When Jonah refused to follow God's directions, God used a giant whale to get his attention. When Jonah was trying to run away from God, God used a whale to swallow Jonah and he stayed in the whale for three days and three nights. But during that lonely time, Jonah did a lot of praying. And he told God that he was ready to listen and that he would go to the city of Nineveh and let the people know that they needed to change their ways and follow God. And you know what? The people in the city listened and they asked God for forgiveness. They changed their ways and promised to live better lives and make better choices. God used Jonah to help save the lives of many people in the city of Nineveh. In the Bible, Jonah 3.10 explains what God did after Jonah spoke to the people of Nineveh and after they chose to change their lives and follow God. It says, when God saw what they did and how they chose better ways to live, he forgave them and protected them. Even though Jonah didn't understand why God wanted to help the people of Nineveh, he did learn to listen to God. Jonah learned to follow God's directions, even when he was afraid and didn't agree. God was trying to help Jonah learn to have compassion for others and to learn that because God loves and forgives us when we have done wrong things, that we should forgive others that have done wrong things. Even when we don't understand God's plans, It's important that we listen to God. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. When you ask us to do something, it's hard sometimes. Please help us to remember to follow your commands, even when we don't understand all of your plans. Help us learn to listen to you. And... Help us to love and forgive others. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days' walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, He rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. No human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, 
and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jonah was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad prophet. But his is a great story. If you've been in church for a while, you probably know that he was swallowed by a great fish, often told as a whale. And if you've been in church for a long time, you probably heard this story in Sunday school. Jonah's story is, of course, about more than getting swallowed up, though that is probably the most vivid detail. Actually, the book of Jonah is only four chapters long, and yet it's full of great details. It's worth reading in its entirety on your own or with your family, and takes under 20 minutes to read. Jonah is actually one of my favorite books in the Bible, and not because it's so short. Most scholars believe that it's actually a parody or a satirical parable, and it's not meant as history. There was an actual prophet named Jonah who lived in the 8th century BCE, but this book is from several centuries later, and a name is about all they share. The book of Jonah begins this way. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. So what does Jonah do? He goes to Nineveh, right? That's what a prophet does, follows God's call, goes where God tells them. Nope. In case you thought everyone in the Bible was perfect and faithful, well, here's your proof otherwise. Jonah basically does the opposite of what God tells him to do and goes to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. Nineveh is today in modern-day Mosul, Iraq. It was actually occupied by ISIL a few years ago, which destroyed many of its antiquities. Bible scholars don't really agree on where Tarshish really was, if it was a real city, Some have suggested as far away from Israel as Spain or England. Basically, Jonah wanted to get as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could, so he goes in the opposite direction. He did not want to go to Nineveh at all. He was avoiding it at all costs. Here's the thing. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. Around the time the book of Jonah was written, almost the entire northern kingdom of Israel had been taken captive and forcibly deported from their lands by the Assyrians. So the Jews who were deported became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel because they never returned. So Jonah gets up on a ship to Tarshish to get far away from Nineveh, but all is not well. While Jonah was asleep below deck, the ship was caught in a storm so bad that Scripture tells us that the ship threatened to break up. The crew threw the cargo overboard and each prayed to their own gods. Then the captain came down to say to Jonah, what are you doing so sound asleep? Get up, call on your God, perhaps the God will spare us a thought that we do not perish. Then the crew cast lots to determine why this horrible storm was happening to them, and the lot fell to Jonah. So they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? 
I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Jonah's solution is extreme. He is surprisingly willing that the crew throw him into the sea. Even the crew are more hesitant to throw him overboard than Jonah. Before doing so, they cried out to God, Please, Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they do throw him over. And finally, we have the part that almost all of us know. The Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah prays a long, drawn-out prayer, and finally, Scripture says, the Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah out. He spewed Jonah out is quite the image. He's probably covered in half-digested fish food and smelling like three days being in the belly of the fish. God once again calls to Jonah, even though he is covered in fish vomit, and tells him to go to Nineveh and preach repentance. Now, let's be real here. Jonah already tried to get out of this twice. First, by taking his ship as far away as he could, and then by being willing to drown in the sea. He clearly despised the city of Nineveh, or else he wouldn't have gone to such great lengths to avoid it. So I doubt he went with any great excitement. Scripture says that he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But it was probably more of a lackluster, 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And yet, in spite of Jonah's reluctance to go, the Ninevites hear his message, repent and turn to God. In spite of a lousy messenger, they respond to the message. God sees this and decides not to destroy Nineveh, but this is clearly not what Jonah wants. This is perhaps the only time a prophet in the Bible whines, Oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah is not a fan of this gracious and merciful thing. Seriously, who complains about God's steadfast love? Jonah does. He didn't want God to forgive Nineveh. He wanted to see it destroyed in 40 days. We don't know exactly why, most likely because of the Assyrians conquering Israel. But he hated the Ninevites, and that's why he was reluctant to call them to repentance because they might actually repent and be forgiven. He was filled with righteous anger against this people he probably didn't even know. This reminds me of the horrible scourge of racism and white supremacy in our country, of people who refuse to see the worth of persons who have a different skin color or language or religion than themselves. Many of those people are professed Christians, and yet they deny the humanity of other children of God. Church of Scotland minister Douglas Galbraith writes that Jonah was written at a time when the emphasis was on the danger to the purity of the race from contamination by foreigners. Policies which cultivated bigotry and intolerance of the stranger. This fear of bigotry and intolerance is alive today. 
for a few decades, it seemed as if the most obvious, most blatant symptoms of this faded away, but now it seems energized in the most egregious ways. There is always an urgent need for the gospel, but especially now it is pressing that we as Christians speak up and act. It is urgent that we proclaim that ours is a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That steadfast love is for all persons, without exception whether we like it or not. Indeed, Jesus came to live among us in order that he would teach us to love one another. The book of Jonah, according to some Old Testament scholars, challenged the reader to contemplate the ways in which God might relate to non-Jews. The book of Jonah conveys the idea of a deity who responds to the plight of non-Israelite and Israelite alike. For us as Christians, I believe it also challenges us to consider how God relates to non-Christians as well. We would do well to remember that just like Samuel's story last week, Jonah's story is also shared by Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Indeed, Jonah's story is also mentioned in the Quran. Perhaps Jonah can also remind us that God's steadfast love extends not just to America or where our ancestors are from, but those places we'd run to Tarshish to get away from too. After God grants grace to Nineveh, Jonah is so upset that he says that it is better for him to die than live. Jonah overreacts a bit. But we could all probably think of such people who might react that way when others unlike them receive favor. Or perhaps such a reaction is deep within our own selves or right on the surface. But Jonah goes to the edge of the city to see what will happen to it. He waits its destruction And interestingly, God takes pity on his drama queen prophet and makes a bush grow up around Jonah to give him shade and to save him from his discomfort. But this bush was also a lesson to Jonah as the next day God made it wither away. And guess what? Jonah wants to die again. God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah grumbles, yes. Angry enough to die. I don't know about you, but at this point, I'm just ready to shake some sense into Jonah. Jonah cares more about that day-old bush than for all the Ninevites. So God says, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city? in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals. The end. That is how the book of Jonah ends, with a question. And it is the only book in the Bible which ends in a question. It is not only a question for Jonah or even those who heard this parable thousands of years ago. Jonah and other Israelites feared the Ninevites out of their own history and experience. But God's grace was not limited to Israel, even when it came to those who had persecuted Israel and God's chosen people. This offended Jonah's sense of justice, and indeed he declared it was why he fled to Tarshish. God's grace and steadfast love are not limited to our boundaries. It challenged Jonah and the original hearers of this story to understand how God's mercy is extended to even those they saw as the worst of all people. It challenges us too. God asked Jonah, should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? What are those places God would say to us today? Should I not be concerned about Palestine, North Korea, 
Iran, Haiti. And I would imagine that God turns that question back to us. Should we not have concern for all of those places and people around the world that do not act, look, or speak like us? After all, Jesus was a brown-skinned Palestinian Jew who spoke Aramaic. God's concern is for the whole world, so it should be our concern as well. But it's not just international, but it's also an issue for our own communities and for our own relationships. Perhaps it's even easier to warm our hearts to those who live far away in countries that we may not ever get to than that neighbor whose actions we don't understand and find infuriating, or that coworker who is plain annoying, or the classmate that bugs you. It is hard to love people up close. But God is merciful and slow to anger, and God's steadfast love is theirs, and it is yours also. So I want you to think of one person in your life who is difficult to love right now, someone you really struggle with. The best professor I ever had was Sister Teresa Kernke, a Catholic nun. And she said that whenever she struggled with some particular church person, for her especially bishops, she had to remind herself that someone loved that person enough to carry them to the baptismal font to receive the waters of grace. If it is a fellow Christian or even church member that you struggle with, perhaps remind yourself that they too are baptized into the body of Christ. Remember, that person needs God's grace and love just as much as you do. Pray for them and your relationship with them. Do not run to Tarshish or jump into the ocean, but pray. Maybe, just maybe this week, we can be part of God's revolution of love. We're not better than Jonah. That's not a condemnation. Sometimes we run away when God calls, especially when it's to something uncomfortable, to a place or people we want nothing to do with. But God's question rings in our ears, should I not be concerned? God should, and we should, for our brothers and sisters across the world, on this continent, in this country, in this state, this community, in our church, at work, in our homes. God calls us to share the good news that Jesus Christ has come to us, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to itself, teaching us to love ourselves, each other, and the world. God calls on us to take that message with us wherever we go, especially if it is to a place that we really don't want to go. We may find ourselves just like Jonah was, that the Ninevites turned around and turned to God. Instead of complaining, may we say with joy, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. To God be the glory. Amen. come now to our time of prayer to lift up to God and in this community 
all those concerns and joys of our hearts and minds. And I encourage you, if you have particular prayer concerns that you would like to share with the church or with staff, that you may share those concerns by calling or emailing our office. And we have a prayer team that is ready and willing to pray with you as well, should you be so interested. So let us pray. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and elders, and for musicians and servers that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God would raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world, for nonprofit and non governmental organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcasts and all who await relief, that in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For our congregation and community, for families big and small, and for the organizations that meet here, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for all relationships, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors and the faith whose lives served as an example of gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people spoken or silent for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Always anger's own 
receive now this benediction. May the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of God, our creator in Christ, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our advocate. Amen.